of you have already prepared your texts and uh, are able to take us through the PowerPoints or essays that you've written. We have up to 11.45 this morning. And then after the experience, we shall move out to, to see what happens next. Okay? So let me just know. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. 20 minutes each. Is that enough? Okay. So I think we are ready to start. Yes. Let's begin. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Uh, my presentation is about the burdens, textual analysis of the play, the burdens. I began by giving you the name of the playwright, who is John Ruganda, genre is drama. Your publication is 1972, and then the publishing house is Oxford University Press. The setting of the play, The Burdens, is in a country in a post independence Africa. The plot of the, the play revolves, is a missing word, around four members of a family. These characters are Wamala, Tinka, Kaija and Nyakake. Wamala, who is the head of the family, is an ex-cabinet minister and jobless. His inability to provide for his family humiliates him and seeks solace from drinking liquor. He attributes his downfall to Tinka, his wife. Wamala, He's too poor that he cannot afford a better house for his family members, and they resort to live in the slum in the same permanent house made of mud and water. Tinka, on the other hand, is unwilling to accept the twist of events. She's nagging and sets the children against their father. For instance, when Kaija asks her why he doesn't have a bed of his own, she tells him to ask his father. She never appreciates Wamala's efforts put in to provide for the family. Case in point is when Wamala buys Kaija a second-hand bed. She's not impressed and says other families have never seen second-hand things in their homes. On the contrary, Kaija, they are, sorry, Kaija, their son, there's a missing word, Kaija, their son, Wamala and Tinka, is an optimistic and programmatic character. Despite the mother's complaints about his father's failure to provide for the family, he's willing to sell granites at school and buy himself a new bed. Nyakake, the youngest child of Wamala and Tinka, is an inconvenience to Kaija. Though her bedwetting is unintentional, she makes Kaija's life uncomfortable. Some of the major concerns of the play are poverty, politics, education, violence, better to mention a few. The concerns and events in the play affect and are interpreted differently by the characters. The characters' interpretations are hinged on how they make sense of the world around them. 
Wamala believes that though misfortune may befall one in life, there's need to identify avenues through which one can evade despair. For instance, instead of staying at home with his nagging wife, Tinker, he spends most of his time in drinking sprays and gambling. Unlike Tinker, who has failed to accept their current status of poverty, Wamala has embraced it with a positive attitude and is willing to share what he gets through gambling with his family. With his family members. For example, except Tinker, Wamala is convinced that Kaija will appreciate the new bed he has bought for him. He believes his efforts put in to buy a new bed will make Kaija happy. Wamala believes every individual needs freedom in making personal decisions on how he or she lives his life. This is revealed in the dialogue below when Tika asks him where he spent the previous night. Wamala, Wamala says, I was here, I was there, I was everywhere. And Tinka says, doing what? Sorry, asks, doing what? Then Wamala says, doing this and doing that. Doing everything, which means I was doing nothing. Then Tinka says, I'm going to kill that bitch of yours. I warn you. Then Wamala says, can't I spend a night with a fellow suffering man? Wamala thinks that though one may fall from grace to grass, if he has ideas, then he, he or she can forge a way forward in life. Though not a practical person, Wamala has invented ideas like that of the safety matches and sl selling slogans. He believes it, that it's such ideas which may push one out of poverty. That, that which may push them out of poverty. He highlights this through the statement below. Wamala says, the international slogan syndicate. Then Tinka asks, what? Wamala says, I'll start selling slogans. Tinka, deflated, stands up to collect her gear. And she says, I'm going to bed. Then Wamala intercepts her and says, is the old girl is a minor slogans with the test. In fact, very creative. Nothing like the put a, a, a tiger in your tank stuff. My slogans must emphasize self-pride, must exploit international prejudices against the African, must redeem us from the rugs of our humiliation. Asserts that poverty is the best incentive. He asserts that poverty is the best incentive to creativity, implying that people should be wise in poverty, but rather use the situation to come up with solutions that can help them come out of poverty or challenges of life in general. She is a perfectionist and believes in an ideal world. She believes that her husband should provide all, necessities, uh, all the necessities for his family members, no matter his financial status. That, that uh, she expects Suamala, that is, she, ex, ex, she expects Suamala to provide a balanced diet, take Nyakake to a good doctor, and buy for Kaija a first hand bed. For example, the dialogue below between Kaija and Tinka reveals this. Tinka says, your father, you asked him about the bed? Then Kaija responds, two days ago, oh damn, this suit stands. Look what I've done to my food. Tinka says, remove them. And he does so. What did he say about the bed? And Kaija says, he simply kept quiet and stared ahead of him for a long time. I felt I had asked a wrong question. He pauses. He frightens me when he keeps quiet. I'm never sure whether he's, asked, he's thinking 
or cooking up something. Then with a sarcastic, a sarcastic laughter, Tinker says, so he actually kept quiet when his son asked him. A laughing father kept quiet. Then another derisive laughter. That is him, Kaija. Keeps quiet to make others silent. Since she believes in a perfect world, Tinka expects Wamala to provide the best for the family. Though, he doesn't have a job at the moment. She challenges Wamala in the dialogue below when he buys a second-hand bed for Kaija. Tinka not looking up from her weaving, she says, we are fed up with second-hand things. Then Wamala says, come on, Tinka, don't be nasty. The bed is still in reasonable condition, strong and comfortable. Bet it will excite the old boy out of his senses. But Tinka says, there are some homes which I've never known second hand. And Wamala says, and there are others that can't afford even 10 hand things for your information. Then Tinka says, you should be ashamed of second. Now that you are saying that uh, second hand things. Unlike Wamala, who believes in ideas, Tinka is a practical character. She solves some of her life challenges through applying practical measures. For instance, she brews and goody and weaves mats to earn some money and provide for her children's needs. Also, because she believes that Wamala is responsible for the family's suffering, she murders him towards the end of the play. On the contrary, Kaija thinks that life is worth living despite the challenges one may encounter. To him, life is what one makes it. Rather than basing on hopeful feelings and wishes, one needs to apply practical solutions to life's challenges. For instance, in the dialogue below, he asks his mother to give him some money so that he can set up a business. Kaija says, good, can you lend me two shillings? Just two. Then the mother is puzzled. Whatever for, son? Kaija says, I'll tell you. I want to start selling roasted ground nuts at school. It pays a lot, mother. No, no, no. Please listen to me. In a month or two, I'll have accumulated enough money to buy myself a bed. This belief is further illustrated when he uproots Kaboga's cotton. His, reasons, his reason for uprooting Kaboga's cotton is because she didn't intervene when his parents were fighting. Rather than watching like others, He expected Kaboga to stop his parents from fighting. He nurses his frustration and disappointment through uprooting Kaboga's cotton and also beats up Tibasaga for disapproving his action of uprooting Kaboga's cotton. For example, he says, Believe me, mother, I did it when I left you fighting. I wandered about aimlessly, and all of a sudden, there she was in her garden working diligently, as if nothing had happened. The sight of her irritated me. What business had she to be in her garden at such a late hour of the evening, while you and father were fighting away like tigers, and people gazing and laughing and cheering? It irritated me. When she saw me, she said, son, have they stopped? That did it. I got a few stones and shoved them into my pockets. And with my catapult, I aimed at her gray head. The stone missed her, her ear by inches. She ducked and screamed out, help, help, and ran for dear life. I fell to uprooting her cotton plants. Tunyakake, the youngest child of Wamala and Tinka, she believes whatever life brings for. Ras should be embraced without complaints. For instance, unlike her brother Kaija, who complains that he needs a new bed, Yakake seems to be contented with the current situation of poverty in their home. A case in point, she's unwell but doesn't ask her parents for better medication, nor does she complain about the kind and racial food 
served in the home. Ladies and gentlemen, that is what I gathered from my discussion. So I welcome. You can still talk to your presentation. Now, something that is out of the text. Sorry? Talk to your presentation. You've been reading to us, now talk to it. Okay, my presentation. In my presentation, I gave you a plot overview of what the burden is all about, the characters, and why they behave the way they do. Um, different characters have different perceptions about life, and this explains why they behave the way they do. Uh, we are told, uh, we are given the reasons why Wamala uh, spends most of his time away from home, and this emanates from the way he perceives life, and so does other characters. Tinker is willing to do anything that will make his family comfortable, and that is his, uh, sorry, her children. And her children also reiterate in a different or divergent manner. Kaija, like I've told you, he is a practical person, and he looks at life in a positive way, unlike um, the mother, who is too pessimistic. And Nyakake, on the contrary, very innocent as she is, she's too naive about the ways of the, uh, of the world. She seems contented with everything around her. Like I've said, she's not bothered about the house or what she possesses. In fact, she asks any, nothing from her parents. And to me, she's more of a resigned character. Anything that comes her way, she accepts it without any complaint. In fact, she only, the only time when we see her very active and maybe participating actively in the play is when she asks the mother towards the end of the play about the whereabouts of the father, Wamala, after Tinka had killed him. I think that is all. Thank I you. Think. Thank you very much. Hey, you people are not happy. Your clapping is like yeah, you are. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah, well, to, to, to thank Rehem again for this very interesting presentation, uh, take you a little back to the text. We have four characters that uh, constitute this play. Nyakake, Wamala, Tinka and Kaija, the best family. But they are involved with events within the entire community and country. She has rightly told us that this play was performed at a critical time in the history of our country. Which year was that? 1972. Do you remember anything that happened there about? 1972? It was the beginning of Idi Amin's reign. And we had gone through, last time we were talking about a play which happened two years after the attack on the Buganda Palace. And now we are looking at one soon after the military coup, led by the same person who led the attack on the palace, the king's palace in Buganda. So I would like you to focus your mind not just on the text on the page, but the context of the play. Because the play is actually, usually, plays are a reflection of the events within the locality, 
And in this particular case, in our country. Interestingly, interestingly, the people who performed this play, at least I have seen all of them, and uh, they, still may, they may still be alive. If you are interested in further interrogating their feel and knowledge of this play, David Chihazo is a teacher of literature somewhere in Kampala. I think he's still alive. But I know Dr. John Kalema is now retired. He has been teaching several years in Makerere University. Uh, Professor Rose Mboa, who later performed Nalukalala uh, Nabanabe, Mother Courage and Her Children. She's uh, long gone to rest. I'm not so sure who Christine Yakana is. I've not seen her, but um, we live in a life full of burdens. And the burden is here reflected poverty, the burden of parenthood, the burden of nationhood, the burden of truth, even the burden of knowledge. The fact that all these things are happening to these children in school, in their neighborhood, and yet some of them feel they can do nothing, and others are convinced that it is their duty to do something about them. While reading this play, The Burdens, you read it within the context of Uganda. We are studying Ugandan literature, and therefore would like to see those traits that the playwright has touched, which are recurrent. Okay? The play helps you to see the country in the perspective of its history, but as you know, Literature does not expire, but it inspires. For you to be inspired into using the past for the present and the future progression, as this, uh, the, 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 the Kaija wants, wants us to believe, then you need to take serious recognition of all the words that are used. These words are not used just because they exist, but they are used for particular purposes. For example, the use of slogans. How much has changed in terms of sloganeering? What do we see over the years, the use of slogans. What is the purpose and impact of slogans? That we live in difficult times. The misfortunes that are surrounding this particular family. The attitude. And also the fact that these people, in order to survive, they are surviving on family gambling. Family gambling. And the yearning for personal freedom to make personal decisions. What is the significance of the bed? That bed. What do you read into the bed? First hand, second hand, of course they cannot afford a first hand bed, so they go for a second hand bed. And the comment is that some people can't even afford a tenth, be a tenth, tenth hand bed. 
What does that tell us about the situation in which this family is living? And yet, they need some slogans to keep their self-pride, to show that we are still the chosen, the chosen of Africa. Not just Uganda, but Africa. And then there's an important statement about Kaija keeping quiet to make others silent. Sorry, Wamala. Wamala. To keep quiet, to keep others silent. What do you read into this voice? How is it possible to gain freedom and who is it that was gagging? Or was it voluntary silence? Do we see that as an issue at all? Does it have any impact on poverty or the absence of it? Joblessness. What do you think about this child who thinks of borrowing money from the mother in order to go and sell some groundnuts at school? Because it can fetch a lot of money, and indeed it does. We see many people on the streets selling one banana at 1,000 shillings, selling a few groundnuts and soya beans at so much. And if you followed up their life, you would see that really they are making a good life out of difficulty. Good life at their level. Others are making even better life out of simplicity. Or oh, is it simplicity? So when you are reading this work, please Bear in mind the stylistic features that the playwright uses. It's not possible to conclude a discussion of any play without looking at the dramatic techniques. In there is where lies the greater message. Like we have already observed, 1972 in the National Theater was not an easy place to put up a show like this. And yet, theater was vibrant, was very vibrant. Many people like the Kawadwas were killed for suspicion that they were actually referring to the regime of the time. And so, the message which keeps this play alive was hidden behind the dramatic techniques, the images like the bed, and the choice of words, the choice of names, the choice of places. Why must it be a family and not uh, something bigger than a family. Because it was possible, and indeed it is possible, to walk around the Mokono and you find a family of this kind. So don't say I'm talking about this country, I'm not talking about Africa, I'm talking about this particular family which is suffering. So I wanted to make these comments to uh, flesh up the discussion by our friend. And please, let us have another five or so minutes to discuss Tinker and the burdens. You want a mic? Yeah, thank you very much, Doctor. I want to thank Rehma for the presentation and the analysis she has presented to us. 
uh, in reference to her presentation and the, the text in particular. Uh, to me, I think it, the, the play is trying to portray the problems that exist in our society. Because at one time, one can ask oneself, who is the burden in this play? Is it uh, Wamala? Is it uh, Tinka? Is it Kaija? I think they were trying to, John Ruganda was trying to tell us that uh, in our society, we all carry equal responsibility, be it uh, a head of a family, be it uh, children or our spouses. Because if, for example, I'm at home and uh, I'm supposed to provide some necessity, I may happen or appear to be a burden to my family, but at the same time, those people who are demanding, they also have a burden to me. So I think this play helps us to understand the situation in which we live and how to go about with it. The language that is used, like you said, it is also used to emphasize some clear points. Maybe on the other, the, on the contrary, uh, Rehma tried to, to cite or quote uh, some dialogues, but uh, I don't know if I've never read that text. Where could I find those points? Because we're just giving us the dialogue between Wamala and Tinka, but uh, where to find them? It could have been that you concocted your own, own dialogue. Yeah, that's what I wanted to say otherwise. Thank you for the presentation. Respond to that. Thank you very Using much. APA. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Paul. I won't use the APA. <laughs> okay, I'd, it was really an oversight, but um, that uh, comment comes at the right time because this is, this, this is just my rough work. Oh, don't tell us that. We are not listening to rough work. Okay, yeah. when I write the uh, original copy. Okay, I'll edit and add in those other bits. And I'll put the pages where I get those quotes in the book. Thank you. The book is here. Tell us. Like which quote? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? Yeah, while Rehma is looking for those pages, this is a very important aspect about our presentations. You do not give us uh, unsubstantiated, um, uh, you know, information. You should very kindly quote the pages, especially that you've told us which, uh, who, which publisher and type of book you are using in your presentation. You're talking about textual analysis. But to follow up on uh, what Paul has just mentioned about uh, responsibility, the last statement of the play, let me please allow me, the last statement of the play, which is given by Tinka, it says, Kaija, they have not come for you. And then there is a loud knocking on the door. And always remember, it was not my fault. Now, he's taking the burden from himself and pushing it elsewhere. It's the duty of you as the analyst to locate, not necessarily to apportion blame, but to find out whose responsibility is it that has resulted into the kind of situation is that this family suffers. When we are looking at our own society, who is to blame? Who is responsible? Whose responsibility is it 
that we find ourselves in the situation that we find ourselves in. The bed. Why are people unable to find first-hand solace? Why must they rely on things that have been regurgitated elsewhere? Questions? Maybe another concern, uh, still from Rehma's presentation. Uh, you noted that uh, you, you told us that play has many concerns, that is uh, ranging from politics, education, betrayal, to violence. Uh, maybe in particular, violence, because we have different types of violence, you, you didn't bring out these concerns where they illustrated and it could be what type of violence? Is it domestic violence? Could you please tell us, maybe, so that we get clear, a clear picture for about the concerns in this particular play? Uh, the concerns in this play, like I, okay, I didn't specifically point out that this is a concern, but through the events that I talked about in the play, most of these concerns are revealed. For example, Omala's inability to buy a first-hand bed shows that he's a very poor man. And then he gambles to get something to survive on for his family. It shows that he's a poor man. And then the violence, okay, I'm just picking a few ideas. And then the violence could be revealed uh, in the way these parents fight every other time, even before their children. And then Tinker kills Mamala towards the end of the play. This is a sign of violence. And then also Kaija goes on to uproot Kaboga's cotton. It's also a form of violence. Sorry? Speak louder. And then the throwing of stones. She's helping me at least cite some of the forms of violence. Then the throwing of stones at Kaboga. All those are forms of violence. Maybe I need, I need to have added that to reveal that these concerns are revealed through these events. Thank you very much. Uh, would you like to talk about the strong allusion, the biblical allusions in the play? yet seen that. But I'm thinking about it. Maybe if there is a colleague who can at least supplement on that, can help. Thank you. Yeah, this is an area that you need to consider, looking at the biblical allusion is in the play. Uh, like on page 38, we have uh, this conversation, curiosity, that's all the pleasures behind the habit. Precisely, the warmth behind, beneath the wimple. You have said it. Wrong track. The forbidden fruit that banished Adam and Eve. It was interesting to find that the little tinker who had turned into a nun at 16 was no virgin. Accusation? Observation. Which mother superiors deceive themselves about? Only once at 15 in the banana plantation. I can believe that. After my mother's funeral, some said it would make me forget. And did it? Yes. I forgot the sight of mother dying in grandmother's hands. Grandfather was away, conveniently, with another woman, man. And then after 13 years of abstinence, 13 years during which mother superiors and the venerable father had turned 
your desires and emotions white and unholy, you made a grand comeback. All the replaced desires suddenly became illicitly desirable and burst forth into a rebellion. I have a feeling you seduced me, in a way. In a way, every woman does. In your case, it was more pointed. Can I come to your house to borrow the complete wax of mouse and tongue? I don't know about that. No room for self-reproach, my dear. It happens every day. Ask any ex-seminarian. Curiosity brought you to me. And you know that. Not your pretty face. Curiosity that killed the cat. Highly loaded statements, highly loaded conversation, which is tending to take attention to the seminary, to the church, in order not to paint the picture of the political scene of the Mao Zedong <laughs> complete experience which probably is one of the main concerns, but not to say that the concern about the pretenses in the church are not being highlighted here. Then he goes on to talk about political opponents. No, you are wrong. I wanted to hit back at my enemies. Political opponents? No, the church, priests preaching hatred on the pulpits. Yeah? Now, it is easy to, 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 to deal with the priests and talk about the priests and you save your skin, but not about the politicians. That's why the play is very quick in uh, Uganda, is very quick to, to give that excuse here so that the attention is drawn away from the political criticism and it is placed on criticism of the church. Not that the church is not worthy of the criticism, but just to make sure that the play can gain its uh, credence within the, the, the context of, the, of its performance. He goes on to say, you didn't tell me. Rallying nuns, fellow priests, and faithfuls against me. Branding our party communist. Now, that's a mix. Yeah? Communists. Who would rape the nuns and turn churches into casinos? Wamala, you were using me all along, I thought. But how could I have told you? Your father was a progressive Christian chief. You know, that is like a party, but in terms of, uh, you know, a, a mix of Christianity and, uh, and local, local leadership. Poor father. All those cows he gave you to slaughter after political rallies, we are appreciated. They won me the independence the independence election. One might almost say, may God rest the old man in peace. So they talk about a political marriage was true after all. So when we talk about a political marriage, what are we talking about here? Kabaka Yeka and UPU. So while you are making your analysis here, do not lose track of the historical perspectives of the play and make a reference to that too. Read about Kabaka Yeka, how Kabaka Yeka joined hands with Uganda People's Union in order to win that uh, election, the coveted independence election. And then later he calls it Chipo Propaganda by my opponents. Marriage, marriage of convenience. Here in this family, 
we see it as a marriage of convenience. Amala clearly says it was not because of your pretty face, but just because you seduced me. Similarly, on the political level, it was not because the parties that we are coming into co cohesion were actually interested in each other's uh, agendas, but just because they needed. What is it that they needed? What do the politicians want? What do the men want? Power. Power. The burden of power. How would you get the power? Manipulation, oppression, coercion, deception, like this girl. She was deceived that uh, in order for you to forget uh, the, the sorrow, you just have to, uh, you know, have some little fun in the what? In the banana plantation. And that was, that's not once, it happens. Uh, I think uh, there is a belief that uh, during the last funeral rites, this needs to happen in order to put a clause to, to the funeral in some cultures. So what do you think I am? I'd seen those priests pressing their chests on young boys and this is the subject of today. Priests, priests are usually men, eh? Mm. Yeah, and when they are pressing their chests on young boys, what is the message being brought out? Homosexuality, sexual abuse, the burden of uh, being able to lead a congregation and still remain afloat. Remember the reading that I read to you this morning? And did you expect me to say to them, sorry, fathers, I'll take no boys next time. Blasphemy. Boy, I gave them what they deserved. Their most trusted nun, the only daughter of an eminent Catholic chief. <laughs> it was a political masterpiece. And in your spiritual dusk, my dear, was my political dawn and their defeat. The way I chewed the host would have made a bone bleed. Wamala takes us away, endeavors to take us away to concentrate on the blame game on a common situation within the church and that in itself helps us, helps the playwright to underscore the message that he needs to make. And that exists in the bleeding of the nation. It made a bond bleed. So the choice of words, though directed at the church, is actually looking at the church as the house, the family, the country, the people. It's not just the name. Poor Jesus. And you can see how the dialogues match up. And I'm going to end at the next one. Poor Jesus, he will never forgive you. And then Wamala says, I got away with it and retired to a sumptuous reception. The police band playing. Hmm? The police band playing. What does the police bring in? Police is supposed to be for keeping law and order. So we are getting into the part of the play where if Wamala is involved even in his marriage with the police band playing, we expect P. 
peace, tranquility, happiness, joy. Da, 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 da. But is it what we see? Does the business uh, that this family engage in, does this business show that they are actually in a peaceful environment with a police that gives them a sense of pride and joy, elevation by the fact that they play good music. Music is supposed to help us heal from our stress and burdens. And there it is. What kind of music do we hear from the police? So independence brings a lot of burdens. It causes all these desires to join hands even when the hands are dirty. You simply have to shake the hands. To get into relationships that otherwise would never have been conceivable. And so Uganda is showing us a society that is subdued in spite of its Christian following. Any other comments? So get to this text and enjoy it. I can see that uh, some of us may not have even touched the first page. But what we are doing in this lecture is to stimulate our desire to read, our desire to enjoy, and it is only for actors, so we have a full house. Four of you can be the actors and the other ones from the audience. And within 45 minutes, the burdens will be off your head. OK? Thank you very much. Next. Thank you very much, Doctor. I'm presenting a text analysis. The author is John Ruganda. The text was published in 1988, and it is The Floods by East African Educational Publishers Limited. Uh, in this text analysis, I looked at the cast. I went ahead to analyze the text in a little more detail. I looked at uh, the some of the major themes and then the language or dramatic techniques that he tried to employ in this text, the floods. So the cast, I have Hediman, who is a military dropout. There are two boys who are non-speaking. We have Cheyune, an old-fashioned traditionist. We have Fisherman in his early 20s. Bogo is an executive of the state SRB, state is an officer an executive who is the chairperson of the land board. 
and then Nancha, a bogus intellectual. Then they are journalists. These journalists are improvised. And then lastly, the soldiers. Uh, this cast is presented in the order of appearance on stage. That's how they appear. Uh, the floods is structured so appropriately into three waves, very closely associated. Each wave, as it rises, gains additional power and carries us to a peak. And with each backwash, revelations are made as we expect another wave before we drown. And the moments of fear and anxiety, of suspense and endurance, of panic and pain, these create a lot of tension in this play. They are felt in the incidents in which Cheyune fishes out a dead body of a brigadier with three nails in his skull and genitals in his mouth. They are present in Cheyune's discovery of a human finger while eating fish at mealtime. They are symbolized in the Icelanders in a rescue boat. Uh, see the dead brigadier rise out of water, proclaiming himself a fisher of men. Gogo also sees floods as people, his enemies coming to demand justice. The emergency warning of the coming floods was a joke. A deliberately planned attempt by Bogo to have Nancha and her mother killed out of sheer jealousy. And this makes us drown richly in the floods. Uh, this is from the program magazine. Uh, the floods is the study of abuse of power by military dictatorship in contemporary Africa and of the dehumanizing effect that this has on both the power drunken agents of the state and those of the oppressed who escape total liquidation at the hands of the former. The play also examines the inhibitory effects of class and privilege on personal relationships. And most positively, the setting for this contemporary classic is an island in Lake Victoria, Uganda. That is by Uganda, 1988. I take you to the first wave. That is an island in Lake Victoria. There are irregular growls of thunder and flashes of lightning. The sky is dark with clouds of rain. And offstage, we hear shouts, cries of all manner of noise from stampeding men, women, and children. And that is the last batch is fleeing the island. The action starts with mere growls of thunder. A man, that is the headman of the island, comes on the stage carrying a bag, a big band of his belongings. He stops and looks back, calling his mates to hurry to the boat. He's using an improvised loudspeaker. That is the floods, page one. A headman using his improvised loudspeaker announces the people that the boat is leaving in the next 10 minutes as he reminds people of what they heard over the radio, that in three hours' time, the floods will ravage the island. At this time, the boat is hawking ins insistently by the shore. He tells them to hurry because the captain is getting impatient and the floods are coming, whether they like it or not. He also tells them that all animals and birds are prohibited, so people are to go along with only their blankets. At this time, two boys enter, and Headman appreciates them as good boys and obedient servants of society as they do not delay. These boys begin chasing each other, a thing which makes Headman upset and orders them to stop and go to the boat as well as telling the captain to be more patient. Headman not says an old man, that is Cheyune, coming towards him. That's good old man. That is it, Grandpa. A little trot does it. A little shamba. We are leaving no food for the floods. No food for the floods. And the rain will soon be on our backs. Steady, steady, steady old man. That is the floods, page two. As Cheyune enters, there is a blinding flash of lightning and a loud peal of thunder, which sends the old man to the ground and headman as well. 
She will not try to recover, but still on the ground with his hands raised the sky, pleading to Kagoro, Lord of the sky, not, not to send the grazing shafts to send the grazing shafts to other islands. And Headman tells him that time is life. That is what I say. Pick up your bag and be gone. That is in the floods, page two. But Cheyune, on his knees, is complaining of his broken back, yet they have a lot to carry. He continues to ask Kagoro to have mercy on them and only deal with the one who has gone astray. At this moment, Cheyune realizes that his gear is wrapped in a red cloth, which to him is dangerous, and Headman blames it to him because he did his own packing. Uh, this is superstition. Headman continues to count down the minutes, and seven minutes to go, ladies and gentlemen, seven minutes. When you go to the floods, page four, you find that quotation. Cheyune wonders what the hurrying is all for, yet no one can time one's destiny. Old man and headman disagree and begin exchanging words. Cheyune tells headman to respect old men since he himself saw headman when he was still young. Old man never wondered why headman was thrown out of the military. Remember, he's a military dropout. A fisherman enters at this time carrying, among other things, a bundle of fish net and a basket of smoked fish. But headman refuses him to go with his net and a basket, because nobody was allowed to carry anything apart from the blanket. The fisherman is wondering how he will survive without the net. Headman orders the fisherman to go and tell everyone to hurry, and as he goes, Headman empties the contents into his big basket and pulls out a smoked fish. He asks the old man to have a bite and go to the boat, but Cheyune tells him it is a custom there not to touch what does not belong to you. And above all, he was no longer eating fish anymore. Headman counts again, but this time Cheyune complaining of people who use the emergency situation as an opportunity by explaining, exploiting other people's misfortunes. The old man insists that he no longer eats fish, though before that he could eat fish mixed with groundnuts. And he says he was once the best fisherman on that island. After a long exchange of words, Cheyune throws a net over Headman's head and pulls him around the stage as Headman tries to disentangle himself from the trap. This act was a demonstration for Headman and Cheyune tells Headman that once upon a time he used to catch a puta, I forgot to quote and put it in italics, which was twice and a half Headman's size so easily. Cheyune narrates the story to Hedman the day he went to Sese one evening into the center of the lake. He says, then all of a sudden, the net on my right became heavy. It weighed down the right side of my boat. I knew it was a big catch. Do you know what it was, son? A man, a military man, dead. Three nails in his head, his genitals ticking out in his mouth. A big stone round his neck his belly ripped open and the intestines oozing out. That is the floods, page 10. Cheune continues and tells Headman that day he found a human finger in the balls of fish. It was the reason he stopped eating fish. Headman announces three minutes to go as Cheune is scared of the ghost that might pull him down the lake. The Icelanders troop to the boat follows and this is headed by Buogo who is dressed in a three-piece suit, a winter coat on top, a ball hat, and an umbrella. Bogo enters asking people if they have seen Nancha. Bogo asks Cheyune whether he has seen a young lady and her mother. Cheyune thinks Bogo is looking for men to be killed, and like those who were killed, and now they have turned their wrath on women. But Bogo wants to see Nancha and her mother to see if, her ma if Nancha and her mother have gone to the boat. Cheyune tells Bogo that it is a matter of time, but everyone will be gulped into the net. Here, Cheyune means the man with three nails in the head who engulfs lovers and people without discrimination. 
Buogo reminds Cheyune of the floods. Cheyune tells Buogo that Nancha told him of the ready announcement, but insists who could time the floods despite Buogo telling him that he should be on the boat. Cheyune tells Buogo that his blood is against the boat, but Buogo tells him that the boat is safe and there is no danger. Cheyune decides to go and check. Buogo goes to the house. Cheyune towards the boat and the headman makes the last call. Last call for one and all. Last call. The boat is leaving in a minute. The boat is leaving in a minute. Dogs are prohibited. Goats are unpermitted. No fish, no fuse. Just you and your blanket. No fish, no protest. That's the, the floods, page 14. The boat gives a last hoot and it drives off. That was the first wave. Then we enter the second wave. And this is the, the, the scene has shifted to an abandoned bungalow, which has two battered easy chairs, an ancient sofa, a table, and an ancha who has marooned herself. The wireless radio, which is the voice of the people, makes an urgent announcement from the means of rehabilitation. Uh, the announcement was confirming that the level of Lake Victoria is going to rise two feet above normal in the next three hours, and the inhabitants of the island must leave immediately, and the Navy, that's the, the army, will come to rescue the stranded people. Nancha not says a man running towards the bungalow, and this is Bogo, and this annoys Nancha. However, Bogo is happy to find Nancha, for he has come asking all people about her whereabouts. Nancha reminds Bogo of the blood that would stink, but Bogo said there was water which washes the blood away. Nancha and Bogo are in remind, Nancha and Bogo remind one another of the past. And at this time, Nancha is not happy with Bogo, who is ever following her up instead of minding his own business. Bogo transforms himself into a journalist with a notebook, that is JWN. Bogo pretends as a journalist by asking Nancha questions like a journalist, and Nancha also transforms into a lady journalist. After this, Bogo reminds Nancha that she belongs to the women league, and so wants to know what Nancha says about marriage. This action takes them through the process of marriage, wedding, pregnancy, and the whole process of nurturing a baby. Bogo and Nancha continue to exchange bitter words, which lead Bogo to slap Nancha. He reminds Nancha of the floods, but she has, but she's hesitant to go with Bogo despite time running out according to the announcement. Nancha tells Bogo that the weather man just fabricated the news because they have never had an accurate weather report. Though Bogo insists that they have to leave or else they will offer themselves the spirits of the lake. He warns Nancha of the ghosts of the departed that visit the island at night. He also tells Nancha that he met Cheyune, who caught a corpse of an army brigadier in his fishing net, and the fellow has never recovered from that experience. Nancha says the papers did not announce it, and wonders how the news would read. Most wanted criminal commits suicide, that's the flood page 35. There is a struggle between Bogo and Nancha, and during the struggle, Cheyune enters, and Bogo draws a pistol from his jacket and fires towards Cheyune, but he misses, though Cheyune <laughs> has collapsed the ground and his gear scattered all over, and Bogo blames Cheyune for not knocking before entering. Cheyune prays to Kagoro, Lord of the Skies, to send his violent shafts to other heads. Cheyune calls Bogo and his mates ambassadors of darkness who are masked with vengeance. Nancha reminds Bogo that he is now left alone and he should be aware of the floods. She tells him that the dead are not dead and they are ready to revenge against him, whatever the case. Cheyune and Nancha are now mocking Bogo, who is afraid of the floods, yet he is the, trou the trouble causer. He wants to go, but Nancha says she cannot leave her there. Nancha also says, in two years, the floods will ravage the island. Nancha allows Bogo to go and face it if he likes. And when she's out of hearing, Cheyune begs to go with Bogo. He continues to pray to Kagolo, Lord of Life, 
to send his violin shafts to other heads. He stands up and goes to the door while looking at Buogo. He closes the door and shakes his head in amazement. The call of the beacon. No one can resist it. That is the floods, page 49. Uh, this takes us to the third wave. That is, the setting is the same as in the second wave, but tidier. And Cheyune is weeping the kitchenware in the sink. Waves are hard rapping against the shores, and the wind is whistling in the trees. Cheyune peeps in the window and is not happy about what he sees. Cheyune is talking alone as if addressing an object outside, but all he asks is to be spared. He continues to explain the situation he's in besides other people who are suffering as a result of the brigadier who had three nails in his head. He explains how Nalubale, having ventured beyond her father's island, was defiled by Nyam, Nyamgodo. Cheyune continues to plead with the daughter of the lake to spare him. Nancha calls from the back room, asking whether Bogo is back, and Cheyune is not bothered about the question. Nancha does not like the noise from the waves, rustling of wind and the dogs barking. She wishes she was at home with her mother, trading flowers at the mission, sweeping and cleaning the church, rearranging Bibles and hymn books for the evening service. Nancha has memories of her childhood, and with these memories, Nancha tells Cheyune that they should go out, but Cheyune declines. He tells her that they are trapped by the floods and ambushed by the one with the three nails, so they cannot go. Some whistling is heard by Cheyune, and this time, not the waves or wind from the trees. Cheyune says it is the patron himself, and it is a danger signal. Nancha thinks Cheyune is imagining, but Cheyune thinks it is the beacon. They switch off the lights in terror, place the table, chairs against the door, and also bar the windows, and they begin to pray. Nancha simply closes her eyes and narrates what is in her mind, and it is Bogo in her mind. Nancha and Cheyune are in fear, and all Cheyune can do is to pray for protection. Bogo from nowhere asks them to open the door for him. Cheyune welcomes him back, and he wants the lights on. Nancha is not happy with Bogo's shouting, cursing, and ordering everyone around. Bogo deliberately insults Nancha by telling her to ask her mother of his manners. Cheyune rearranges the room. Bogo and Nancha pick up a coral. Bogo asks for a drink, but Nancha insists she's not his wife. Nancha reveals to Bogo his planned incident of the imaginary floods, as this was the only way to get Nancha and her mother on the boat so that the massacre happens. Arrest innocent people for and blame them for the incident, but promise them presidential pardon if they confess in public for the crimes they did not commit. Nancha begins to remind Bogo how he used to treat her during their childhood. He used to peep through the small holes in the hall, and Bogo would shoot at her using the toy gun. She remembered the day she was slapped by her, by her mother because Master hated the noise. Master, that was Bogo's father. This memory has made Nancha to tremble and almost break down with the tears rolling down her cheeks. Bogo gripped and doesn't know what to do, but he's sorry and sympathetic to Nancha. Nancha tells Bogo that the weeping, that weeping the entire community in cold blood was that she knew of all his possessions and she would tell it all. That was the reason why the planned incident for the imaginary floods was created so that Nancha and her mother are killed. They pick up a quarrel once again, and this is for the baby that Bogo thinks Nancha is carrying, yet he fears responsibility. To him, anybody could have done it. And it could have been his friend, Norman. This was the doctor, the male doctor. Bogo reminds Nancha of all her life and how she related with men, classmates, lecturers for her promotion. Bogo promises to wed Nancha, but she is not interested. They continue insulting one another, calling one another murderer, swindler, academic fraud, etc. At this point, Nancha threatens to publicly expose Bogo's actions through press conferences, newspapers, etc., both local and international. 
Bogo gets scared and asks Nancha to cut out the cut and rat game. He requests Nancha to be genuine friends, reminds her of the time they used to go out for picnics every weekend, parties, dances, and they were inseparable. They act out their first encounter at the zebra crossing along Republican Road. Nancha tells Bogo that she does not know her father and that it could be one of the four military men who raped her mother in the absence of her father. Nancha resumes the story of the pregnancy, reminding him of what he used to say about it. But when he said she had missed her periods, and that was the beginning of the problem, at this time, Nancha tells Bogo that she aborted. Abog gets scared, but it was Nancha's wish to do so. As they revive and relish their friendship and their wedding plans, Cheyune enters, but embarrassed with what she finds, and the two disengage themselves, but with a lot of wishes. Cheyune tells his master that they are coming. The door bursts open, enter two soldiers. That is the floods, page 105. The first soldier orders them to put their hands up, but Bogo thinks they are mistaken. They ask for his name. Occupation, as the first soldier writes it down. He says he's the chairman of the building board, as first said by Nancha. The first soldier reminds him that they know all his particulars, and they ask if he is not the boss of the State Research Bureau, that is SRB. Bogo accepts and is asked to follow them. Cheyune reminds us, this is the last statement in the play, Cheyune reminds us that the call of the beacon, no one can resist if, if time has come. Uh, that is the analysis. I went and looked at the themes. The first one I tried to look at is oppression. Uh, there is a lot of oppression by government in this play, and many people are dying, they lack what to eat, since their land has been grabbed by mercenaries who terrorize them, and this is evident in the dialogue between Buogo and Nancha, since, it is, since in this play, Buogo is the main agent of the oppressive government. I looked at cruelty, a lot of people are being killed in this play, and we see Buogo giving orders to the State Research Bureau to kill people in large numbers, and more so if anyone crossed the line of government. Uh, when Cheyune fishes out a man, and Nancha says the lake is full of blood, and these are, these are all signs of killings that were going on in Uganda. Another incident occurs at the International Hotel when Buogo orders the killing of an innocent man for dancing with Nancha, whom Buogo had interest in, was interested in. Uh, there's also death and suffering. Men were killed for no good reason, and this is evident when Cheyune uh, catches a man with three nails in the head and these gentles in the mouth. This means that this man really suffered before meeting his death. Bogo also organizes the rescue boats for people with the intent of killing Nancha. Uh, there is a lot of fear and anxiety. Fear is depicted in the old man, Cheyune, when he fishes a dead man the brigadier, with three nails in his head, and Cheyune swears never to go back fishing. He also finds a human finger while eating fish, and he vows never to eat fish again. The, these are all signs of fear and anxiety. For example, when you go to the floods, page 9, Cheyune says, do you know, Sese, son, I cast my nets as usual and paddled along. There's some other words. Then all of a sudden, the net on my right became heavy. There are also some other words. I knew it was a big catch. Do you know what it was, son? A man, a military man, dead. Three nails in his head, genitals sticking out his mouth, a big stone around his neck. That is the fear that old man Cheyune was going through. Cheyune also expresses fear when he witnesses the massacre of the Icelanders in the rescue boat. Bogo also expresses fear as he sees floods of people who come to revenge against him for his injustice. And this one is illustrated when Nancha says, the boss of the State Bureau is trembling like a leaf. Cheyune, come and see your master's mnemonic tremors. That is page, the floods, page 45. 
There's also corruption as a theme. Corruption is so much in this play. For instance, boss is corrupt because he uses his position to, re to recruit only his relatives, like Buogo, his cousin, to be the chairman of the building board and at the same time, head of the state research bureau. This makes, this makes Buogo promoted so fast and earns a lot of assets and property. Uh, there's also hypocrisy. There's a lot of hypocrisy in this play. First and foremost, Bogo plans the floods. And they tell people that the rescue team will come for them, yet it is a planned move to trap Nancha and be killed on the boat. But also, to be good to Nancha, yet he wants them to be killed well on the boat. Uh, there is materialism as a theme also. Is another theme in this play. For example, boss is materialistic. And even the locals and everybody, it is everybody. For example, Buogo says, neighbors would fish over some barren stretch of land simply because some white prospectors said there, is, there might be oil. And this one is illustrated when Bogo says, neighbors fighting over some barren stretch of land simply because some white prospector said there might be oil. There are some other words. Mind, mind you, that is enough to make our neighbors jump at each other's throat. So it means the neighbor is also materialistic. That is the floods, page 27. Then I went and looked at language. Uh, the first uh, device is symbolism. Uh, the title itself is a symbol of death. Because when rainfall is beyond normal, to the extent of flooding, it threatens people's lives because it carries away everything. So this is the time when many people were being killed, and because Uganda could not come out directly, he used symbols to represent the actions of the government towards its people. Dialogue. Uh, throughout the play, we see characters acting and talking, and their conversations that take place resemble real-life communications. There are dialogues between characters, for instance, Headman and Cheyune, Nancha and Cheyune, Nancha and Buogo, soldiers and Buogo, and all these are uh, as if in real life situation. We also have similes. There are many similes in this play. Uh, these are comparisons between objects and people. For instance, Bogo tells Nancha that he cannot talk to himself all the time while Nancha stands like a lamp post. Bogo says, Nancha, you go, you, you got to say something. I can't talk to myself all the time while you stand there like a lamp post. That is the floods, page 18. Nancha also uses a simile to describe Bogo's trembling. Nancha says, the boss of the State Bureau is trembling like a leaf. That is the floods, page 45. Nancha also uses a simile when Bogo crawls on the table, squats as he observes the approaching floods. And Nancha uses this to describe the way the floods were coming for Bogo. Nancha says, you once thought yourself unreachable, untouchable, like you have already thought indispensable and in this possible. But here they come. There are some other words. Here they come, as patient as this, as sure as silence, the final silence. That is the floods, page 47. And then lastly, I looked at, uh, I looked at proverbs. Lugano also uses a lot of proverbs in this play. For instance, when Nancha is with Bogo at the International Hotel dancing with another man, Bogo is annoyed and orders his men to kill an innocent man. Bogo uses a proverb, contempt breeds familiarity. That is page 32. I want to thank you. That is what I managed to, to present. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that takes us to close to 11 o'clock. Um, what have you heard? The floods comes in quite handy from the previous of John Ruganda's plays, The Burdens. And um, as you have very well given us good food for thought in terms of style and in terms of real content, 
while we are presenting, I was thinking how prophetic literature can be. That uh, we have Vogo, or is it Ruabogo? And uh, seven years, are we talking about Museveni? Um, did you see what I saw? Seven minutes to go. Seven minutes. Huh? Uh, that you come sound. Seven. We have to move in those bundles, in that emergency situation. And maybe that doesn't make a lot of sense, but the red cloth. Is that red? <laughs> the red cloth that has caused a lot of confusion today that by having that red cloth in the parliament or wherever, it is a sense of danger. Are these people using it consciously or not? Is it something that just captured them or some of them are literary students that uh, they are trying to show us that we're actually uh, having a similar situation? The improvised speakers and loud speakers, the media houses, the media centers, and in particular, the recent events where we had the number of messages coming out and they are all unproven, or they are still under consideration. People running away from uh, custody and ending up in hospital, just like the brigadier who is a fishing man and being fished out with the right things in the wrong place. You know, whatever is happening, bogus professors who are able really to tell that actually there is no flood, yeah. how bogus are they? And anyway, they are also, you know, having relationships with the powerful State Research Bureau who are also manipulating land. That there is oil that has been discovered, so somebody from inside has to be the one in charge of that piece of land. So we have to change the land laws. Uh -huh. At each other's throats. And this is which year? Not now, and yet precurrent. So again, to emphasize that uh, when you are studying these texts, without necessarily being um, an apologist, you are supposed to look at the context in which the play is happening in order to tell that actually the playwright is or was a great playwright to appreciate that the message they perform about, the message they portray, is timeless. It may be true today as it is true tomorrow and the distant future. Issues about impatience, uh, desire for obedience, uh, the conduct of children, and the bare fact that as a commonwealth, we are Victorian, aren't we? So the island in the middle of the Victoria is simply any country under the commonwealth. Suffering and experiencing the same kinds of catastrophes. And so we are challenged by the situation that um, not only uh, Nancha and the people on the island face, but what exactly is happening to this island and the islanders that we are. Any other comments? Yes. Mm, about this presentation, just like you said, I would have loved him at least 
to show how these events portrayed in the text or the play are related to the main message of the text. And then you're also supposed to have commented about the effectiveness of the style used, because you only highlighted the type of style, but how is it effectively used in the text? How does it portray, how does it reveal the message in the text? And then, um, like in analysis, we, expect, we are expected, I didn't do it, but I feel we are expected at least to give a conclusive phrase about the analysis of the text. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for the concern. Uh, you talked of uh, the effectiveness of the grammatic techniques. For example, when you look at uh, when you look at uh, dialogue in particular, or symbolism being in the title, how is it effective that Uganda uses this as a symbol to bring out what is going to happen? So because he does not want to come out directly, he uses the word floods, that when they come, they wipe everything. They kill everything. So when government is in control, they have powers to do whatever they, they like, because you can't control the floods. If they come, if you are in a valley, you cannot escape. So is the government. So the title, the floods, as a symbol, Uganda is trying to bring out, to, to relate, correlate government and the floods. The way they come, you, have no, you can't resist. Then for the dialogues, these dialogues that he, happen throughout the play, the characters are trying to bring out the message that is happening. Like the doctor is saying, it is not necessary for the sake of the play, but they are trying to tell us what is happening and what is going to happen. For example, it is 88. He talked of uh, the, the red cloth that he, Cheyune, he himself, he himself used when parking. But he's again blaming Hedman not to have warned, not to have warned him. Let's, let's take it to our present situation of UPC, red color. Remember, it, that color is for UPC, and it has been allowed for a long time. Now, if it comes today, that people are putting on red today as they are protesting, they forget that they've been using that red color. But the question is, how are you using it? So this dialogue and then the dialogues and the symbols, the proverbs, they try to bring out what is happening in our society today, like M7. In fact, it is 88, that is after. That is after, this is when M7 is in power. And when he says seven means to go, seven means to go, three means to go, it is all symbolizing what is happening in our society. So I think I may, I may not elaborate so much to your satisfaction, but that is a, how I can try to, to respond to your supplement. Thank you. Mm, yeah, a point of correction that this play was conceived long before, during the Amin's time, and it was first performed in 1979. Here in the text itself, we are told the floods was first performed at the French Culture Center, Nairobi, on 1st March 1979 by Nairobi University players and then it was later transferred to Education Theater 2, University of Nairobi. The cast is there. Uh, then it went to Sarajevo in 28th of March up to 18th of April, 1979. So 
the fact that it mentions things that are happening in the post Amin era is of great interest to us. In the third wave, we get words like Okay, there is a comparison between the interest of Nancha and the mother to be happy arranging flowers and hymn books in church. And on the other hand, we have got the use of words like being trapped, ambushed, the thunderbolt in the, you know, you know, in the thunder, the floods, switch of lights, the bar, the windows, Close eyes, keeping close eyes, shouting, cursing, ordering everybody in the crowd, the quarrels in between the people, bitter exchange of words, floods in the mind, and you know, president's pardon for the armies, for, for, for the sins that, or the crimes that people did not commit, are all quite characteristic of the Commonwealth countries, the Victorian islands, being islands as if they are independent. That's what it means to be an island, and yet completely dependent on the mainland. The mainland where they are being told, what you see here, what you observe here is not right, it's not correct. There is going to be a flood. And so we must cross these turbulent seas you must come out of your peaceful house across the turbulent sea to go and become something else. That's what it means by the boat crossing those infested, death-infested waters to go onto the unknown side of life. And so when we are presented with names like headman. What is the headman supposed to do and supposed to be? Che you name. You might want to go into even the nomenclature of the Baganda. What is Che you name? Go for it. Go for it. Yes. And what happens? Bogo. From which area is Bogo, and what does Bogo mean in terms of names? And what, how does he live? Nancha. Hmm? What kind of person is a Nancha? Okay. And then there is also something that is mentioned somewhere. You will have to look for it. Uh, the common challenges within universities, that which makes high bogus, uh, you know, professor, eh? is it sex for Marx? Eh? Eh. How is she or even our Commonwealth universities able to overcome this vice? Because we might point our fingers at the church, point fingers at the politics, but also academia. What is happening in academia? What is happening in the journalistic fraternity? Who are the people there? How is it that we are relying on the weather forecast from the Ministry of Rehabilitation? Hmm? Rehabilitation. What has rehabilitation got to do with the weather forecasting? That they should be the ones to be sending, to be sending the message about the flood. Okay, please. Conclude. Thank you very much, Doctor, for the compliments and supplements. Uh, I think this play, like Dr. has said, it helps us to understand our society today, 
how we have to live with authority and also do our own, our own business. Because if you lie so much, you may end up being disillusioned. It reflects the real life situation in which we are living. And it gives us, an, it works as an eye, op, an eye opener for us as literature students. What I've realized is that uh, as we read and uh, analyze these texts, we need to think beyond the lines to have our own analysis, our own interpretation, and how we have to relate the real life situation to the text and the messages or themes that are being portrayed there. You see, literature is, is funny. It doesn't present issues on surface value. You need to, to read and internalize before. That's why if someone is not a, a student of literature, you may read and take it for the sake of reading and think it is, it is that. But us as students of literature, we have the opportunity and I want to thank the doctor for opening our eyes more and more. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Let me just read to you a little extract here from what Nancha says, now that uh, some of us may be in her shoes. He is now pricking orange peels and rotten pears with you know, orange peels and rotten pears with the tip of the umbrella and slashing the flowers with it like a drunken executioner. That's a statement full of, it's loaded with meaning, loaded with images, and each of them has an implication just to appease his wanton pride. His job has been accomplished by the State Research Bureau boys, SRB boys. Jolly good fellows, he tells himself, whistling and capering around capriciously. Hardened mongrels, consciences as blank as they are black with evil, always following orders to the letter. Spot your query, and they'll fret with him, fret him out at the most obscure borough. Oh, sorry, Baro. Cheyune in the background is thoroughly engrossed in prayer, sometimes lifting up his hands in supplication, and at other times genuflecting it to see this should be done without distracting the audience's attention away from Nancha. Now, this instruction here is giving us a clear comparison between the common man. Here everything happens and we are on our knees and doing all sorts of prayerful uh, expressions. But in the regime, things are happening. Yes, she says, I remember them once at the Imperial. You remember the Imperial? It's now a shopping mall. Posh place that. VIPs and invited guests and the CRB boys are noticeably around. Unobtrusive, but observing the slightest wink or a twitch of the mustache. My first date with Bogo, they were, there we were, four of us around one table. Bogo, myself, and friends of his. An illiterate TP tycoon who kept silent most of the time, and headmaster of some school. When I was reading this, I kept reflecting on this other person who didn't have an identity card, but had a paper, I think a bond paper from uh, prison or somewhere, and he was there working at uh, this recent funeral, and he has been arrested as first suspect. This is what came to mind. It came in the papers. It came in the waves. Then there was that suspect. We talked and joked and danced, and it was a marvelous time. 
But our TP tycoon friend was feeling left out and gradually withdrew into himself. For some strange reason, he didn't quite click with the headmaster. He was carefully and secretly observing the way he talked, the way he drank and smoked his cigarettes. He didn't fancy the slightest thing the headmaster did, nor did the headmaster know what was happening, though I suspect he sensed that most behind the silent man. Then out of the blue, while Bogo was dancing, the tycoon blew up. What you thinks you dozing? <laughs> what you smoking toilet paper? <laughs> you laughing me? This toilet paper man go fixing you if you don't quiet. Do you heard? No laughing and drunkening and talking like Queen Zabeth. Do you thought because you of your dingries you can embroil your England here? You goes toilet now if you don't quiet. And I goes made you eat it proper, proper. So you quiet. You bearded me. You hearted me? Stop biting your complete, stop, stop, uh, stop biting your England here. I'm talking you. I can embroider you twice complete and also. And no mosquito can swing about your dengries. The master was stunned and simply said, what have I done now? What have I said that has annoyed Mr. 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 What has annoyed you, sir? She just, she just told me, you manufacture toilet paper. And I, I said, great. Was that an insult? That did it. The tycoon clicked his fingers once and said in a second, the SRB boys were on the spot. They bundled him out of the imperial and that was the end of him. His corpse was found floating in the lake a week later. So, education, yes. You can be educated and sit here and say whatever you are saying, but the situation can be the same. What is your English for? What is your degree for? What is your knowledge for? And that was the situation we went through. That is a situation that was characteristic of the context of this play. As to whether this context is still persisting, that is for you as a scholar to judge and analyze. But most importantly, what are the lessons? Please draw some lessons from this kind of writing. That style of uh, you know, the, the, the play within a play in there, how is it informative of the vivid nature of what is happening now and then? Lastly, the use of the two skulls in the name The Floods on the book and the red color of the, 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 the text. What is all this? What kind of meaning does it add to the play and the text? I thank you. That is the floods. Can we have one more? We would like to hear all of you, but it looks like, um, yes, let us have one more. Even if you are going to read, please move up. Change seats, go the other side so she can use that place. Okay. Behind. I'm going to give a brief summary on the bride. 
by Austin Bukenya, published in 1987 by East African Publishers in Kampala. The Bride was written in 1984 by Austin Bukenya. This title is based on the concept of a play, Two Husbands, One Night. The play is divided into four movements. Each movement has the capacity to stand on its own as a short play with the beginning, middle, and an end. Though there is no explicit mention of the passage of time between movements, it is clear to a reader that time has passed between each movement. For example, it is evident that only a few hours have passed between the first movement and the second, while a few days have certainly passed between the second movement and the third, as well as between the third and the fourth. Of the four movements, each movement is structured to be shorter than the, than the one before, which gives an impression that there is a rush to get to the end of the play. Or perhaps we are to read that there is a suggestion to let go of the past quickly and focus on the future and the future events. With a quick wrapping of the play in movement four, leaving the situation unexplained with no indication of the consequences of this culture, Bukenya seems to suggest that the handing of power from generation to generation might be too rushed, although everything seems to be working out for everyone. I quoted that from Joan M. Chivanda. The play portrays the transitional zone between African traditional ways and culture with the Western civilization of the albinos, the white men. The names of the characters in the play are African, in origin, and the play is based on generally recognizable African realities and concepts, such as the attainment of maturity through initiation, the search for supernatural guidance and help through divinations, and the role of parent in marriage of their children. So I, I summarized according to the movements. Movement one, which is about the dance of the initiates, the invites take place at the village arena, an open space apparently left for performing public or social activities. Lekindo and the other initiates are seen dancing towards the center stage. The dance continues for a few minutes. Then Lekindo gestures the three gestures, and there is a break, sorry. Lekindo informs the initiates that the dance should start formally since they, la since they have made enough warm-ups. The male initiates, however, remind him that the dance could not start because Navua, who was named the moon of the dance, had not yet arrived. Therefore, the formal dance could not begin in her absence. The female initiates, on the other hand, are seen protesting as to say Navua should be chosen the moon of the dance every now and then, yet she's a foreigner and not initiated by circumcision into the Rika. They remind Lekindo, their leader, that it was a taboo for the uncircumcised Nambua to join in the sky dance. They insist on naming another moon of the dance among the female initiates. This protest seems to annoy Lekindo, their leader, who reminds them of the agreement they made to admit Nambua into the Arika, even if the elders refuse to initiate her because of her being foreign. The male initiates support Lekindo, but the female initiates, who apparently are jealous, refuse and threaten to boycott the sky dance. This causes conflict in which bitter exchange of words takes place between the male and female initiates. Lekindo seems to be disappointed by this disagreement. He, therefore, allows them to name another moon of the dance. Kajiru is chosen to be the new moon of the dance and Sam Samiji being the son of the dance. Drums begin again. No sooner had the dance begun, the Navua arrives at the arena. She is cheered and applauded by the male initiates and the dance momentarily stops. Navua tries to explain her reason for being late but she is cut short by the female initiates who seem to be disinterested in her tale. Kajiri says that the dance is cooling upon their breasts. Navua's apology seem satisfactory to the male initiates but a loophole to the female initiates. She says that her late arrival is because she saw Nagwede and Ingangenya 
the village elders, standing and talking in the middle of the path leading to the arena. Therefore, she could not let them see her since they could have suspected right away that she was breaking the taboo by mixing with the initiates. Nambua was not allowed to mix with the initiates because she's a foreigner and uncircumcised. Male initiates feel sorry for her and promise to protest to the elders about that tradition. Lekindo tells the initiates that Navu has arrived, there are four, should be the moon of the dance as planned earlier. But the female initiates complain so much in that three of them, Ntuta, Kuye, and Kajiri, protest and incite the others to boycott the dance, the sky dance, so that the male, in, the male may leak their foreign cow Navua. This disagreement is almost this disagreement almost results into a fight when the male initiates pull Kajiri from the mound. The female initiates, Ntuta, Kuye, and Kajiri, walk out in protest, leaving behind the male initiates dancing with Navua at the arena. The three female initiates report the incident to Nagwede and Ingahenya. The two elders never believed what they were hearing, since they knew that. It was a taboo for the foreign uncircumcised girl to dance in the arena with the circumcised initiates. The elders go to the arena, witness for themselves. On not seeing their presence, Navua collapses, which marks the end of the sky dance that day. The two elders rush to the village to report the taboo to the rest of the elders. Lekindo and Navua remain alone in the arena as the other initiates leave for the village. Navua tells Lekindo about the surprise feast which has been made by the two elders since none of the initiates noticed their appearance. He assures her safety in his hands since they had promised to fight the bad traditions and customs of this society. Shundo, Lekindo's father, arrives at the arena and finds Lekindo and Navua holding each other. Shundo is surprised and does not believe his eyes. Shundo wishes he did not find the two, Navua and Lekindo, in that position. There follows a bitter exchange of words between father and son. The conflict is as a result of the principles of the two. Shundu is a traditionalist and conservative, while Ekindo is, is a liberalist and wants changes to be made to the traditional customs of the society, which he considers outdated and harmful to mankind. According to Lekindo, the laws and customs of the society are harmful because they interfere with the life of the living while they are ancestral beliefs. Lekin says that the ancestors should let us have a share of the sun and wind while we live since they are already dead and cannot control the living. The conflict that arises between Shundu and his son, Lekindo, makes Shundu curse his son by telling him never to claim fatherhood of him. By the events in movement one, we encounter Lekindo's first obstacle in his plan to fight for a change concerning the outdated traditional customs of society. Lekindo is disowned by the father because they differ in principles. And in movement two, we go to the secrets of the shrine. The events take place at the shrine, a sacred temple of Wanga, the god of the plain. The interior of the temple is visible and Lerema, Wanga's priest, is standing in front of Wanga's lord, a heap while a Sijori, a rich villager, is seen moving backwards out of the shrine. Lerema recites farewell blessings over him. Lerema recites farewell blessings in the name of Wanga, their God. He says, may Wanga keep you fixed, then firm as the mvle which surround the shrine. Wanga is an all-powerful God who manages everything in the plain, and Lerema is the priest and diviner of Wanga. Nkumbu, Lerema's wife, enters from inside. She's seen intervening her husband about what brought Lesejuri to the shrine. Lerema explains to Nkumbu about Lesejuri's misfortunes, which to her are a fortune and disbelief. She is amused. She says, Aha! Let me have my love, Lerema. Nkumbu cheers at the fact that Lesejuri is bringing two cows to the shrine if his wife, who ran away, comes back. The Rema and Nkumbu are accumulating wealth for themselves by capitalizing on the villagers' problems. They are only, their only worry is the barrenness of Nkumbu. They do not have a child. Their only son, Leti, died at infancy. Nkumbu, however, disputes this. She claims that Elerema does not die. 
and adds the letty and adds that letty should be given a wife to marry. These couples keep the skull of their late son in Wanga's lord, a heap in the temple. Nkumbu removes the skull, which she claims that she was given by Wanga. Shundu soon storms at the shrine as the couple debate on, fanny, on finding Letty a wife. Nkumbu hides the skull where she notices Shundu's presence. Shundu wants Selerima to summon the people of the plains because of what he calls Wazim that has entered the children's heads. Shundu almost beats the message drum himself, but Lerima restrains him. Lerima takes the message drum and beats it to summon the people of the plain for an urgent meeting. Shundu wants to inform the people of the plain about the taboo which has been committed by the Rika of the Albinos, who have admitted and allowed Nanvua, a foreigner and uncircumcised girl, to dance in the village arena with the other initiates. Since Lerema is the priest of Wanga, then he should be directly involved in the cleansing of the plain. The people of the plain soon assemble at the shrine, and Shundu is given chance to say why he has called the people. The people of the plain are surprised at what the Rika of the Albinos have done by initiating Nanvua into the Rika when it knows that it is a taboo. The elders think that the albinos, the white men, are the ones who have influenced the Rika to name after them and behave so. They suggest that the albinos must be killed. The male initiates also arrive at the shrine led by Lekindo. They suggest that they will not kill, but rather will fight in the presence of the elders and all the people of the plains. Lekindo tells the villagers to stop their hatred and forget their differences at Wanga's Lord. This statement makes Shundu so angry that he grabs Lekindo and struggles with him. They are separated by Lerema. Lerema calls Mario aside so that he could have a man-to-man -man talk with him. Mario narrates to Lerema how people have been, sh how people have been shooting insults at him in his courtyard and on the path of the plains about his being a foreigner and how the girls in the rick of the albinos shouted at Mario, telling him to stop Navoa from their dance or else they will kill her. Lerema suggests to Mario that the means of solving the problem between Navoa and her agements, Lerema says that Navoa should be married off to Leti, the skull, his late son, who died at infancy. This surprises Mario, but Lerema insists that let is a Lerema, and the Lerema does not die. He tells Mario that if the marriage is accepted, then Mario will also be a father of the shrine because Nanvua will be a handmaid of Wanga. Mario agrees to think about the matter since Lerema promised him that it would be a secret between the two of them. The couples, Nkumba and Lerema, are seen making gestures of waning on their plans to get Letty a wife soon. This is an element of hypocritical behavior by the priest and his wife. And in movement three, we are in um, Mario's homestead. The events in movement three take place at Mario's courtyard. Navoa is seen kneeling at the grinding stone, grinding millet. Her parents are away, therefore, she is alone in the homestead. Lekindo sneaks into the compound, tiptoeing to the grain store, and taps Navoa's leg. When she is just about to enter the grain store for more millet, Lekindo convinces Navoa to stop the grinding in order to accompany him out, to the com out of the compound. In their conversation, Lekindo wonders why there is a sudden close relationship between the Lerema and Mario's family. He says that he saw tattoo Navoa's mother with Nkumbu. Lekindo tells Navoa that he wanted them to go to their secret place above the spring at the tender grass on the rock. This is an indicator that Lekindo and Nanvua have been meeting secretly and most likely her virginity has been broken by Lekindo before marriage, which is against the traditions and customs of the society. Nanvua and Lekindo leave the compound. Nanvua takes a pot of fetching water in the pretense that she's going to fetch water. No sooner had the two left than Tatu, Nanvua's mother, enters carrying a band of firewood. Navoa's mother not says Navoa's absence and the abandoned millet at the grinding stone. She starts calling her a la she starts calling her aloud, but gets no response. Mario soon 
enters and warns her against calling the daughter aloud, believing that the spirits would repeat the name of their daughter, hence causing bad omen to her. The Roma has planted a spear at Mario's homestead, an image of the proposal to Mario's daughter. Mario explains to Tatu, his wife, about the proposal made by Lerema to have Nahua married to his son. Knowing that Lerema's, Lerema's son, Leti, died at infancy, Tatu refuses the proposal and condemns it before the husband. She says that her daughter cannot get married to a skull. A hot exchange of words follows between the couple, Tatu and Lerio, when Nahua enters carrying a pot of water on her head. Tatu informs Navoa of the proposal of her marriage to the skull. She seems not to understand anything about marriage. It is also found out in, the, in this movement that Navoa's virginity is no more. It has already been taken away by Lekindo, the leader of the initiates, who capitalized on Navoa's ignorance. Tatu accepts the marriage proposal, which she had refused earlier on. Her aim is to avoid the shame that would occur in case it is discovered that Navua was no longer a virgin before marriage, which was against the customs of the society. Lesijore, the rich villager, is seen together with Ngahenya, drinking beer as they discuss the marriage plan. As soon as people leave the homestead, the male initiates enter, led by Lekindo. Their intention was to meet the elders and tell them about their plan to protest against Navua's plan, planned marriage to the skull. They promise to fight with their bare hands without using spears. In movement four, our final movement, where the climax is, Night of the Skull. The events take place at the shrine, the Rima's home. Nkumbu is seen preparing Leti the Skull for the arrival of his bride as Lerima watches her. Nkumbu is seen washing and oiling the Skull as she speaks a word of blessing since Letty is eventually getting himself a wife. Guests are seen arriving and grouping themselves in the courtyard. Meanwhile, Nkumbu puts the skull in a pot after preparation and pronounces her last blessings to it. Navua, now a bride, is carried in a shoulder carrier in the escort of several women and the female initiates. Kajiri, Ntuta, and Kuye, who also perform a bridal dance, as they lead Navua to the bridal chamber. Navua is very uncomfortable and tries to sneak out of the chamber before Sikitu, her auntie, holds her back. Sikitu remains alone with the bride and does the last counseling to the bride, who is by then in the bridal chamber. It is in the course of this counseling that it is noted that Navua is to be married to, the, to Lerema and not Leti, the skull. According to Navua, Lerema has no son, and she protests that she cannot get married to the withered old man who is her father's age mate. The secret of the marriage was revealed to Navua when she insisted to her auntie that she wanted to see Lerema's son. Her auntie says, Lerema's son will be your son. Navua blames her parents for lying to her that she was to marry Lerema's son. However, Sikitu confronts her by assuring her that things would be all right since Lerema is the beloved of Wanga. Nanvua insists and stands firm by her decision of not accepting to marry Lerema. She even threatens to kill herself in case she is forced to marry the crumbling old ghost. Sikitu tries her best to convince her that men never grow old and even goes further to give Nanvua family life protective charms after which she leaves the bridal chamber, and Nanvua remains alone in the bridal bed. The kindo and other male initiates sneak, in, sneak to the shrine. They storm into the bridal chamber, take the skull, and give Nanvua protection, then escort her out as Le Kindo goes to the crowd. Le Kindo is seen addressing the crowd as Samiji, Melani, and Chitavi, the male initiates, arrive with Nanvua. They are carrying the pot with the skull. Le Kindo criticizes. when the skull is crushed by the initiates to pieces. At the end of the play, the Rema concedes defeat and crowns Lekindo to be the heir to the shrine and Navua a handmaid of Wanga. 
the Rema declares like Hindu and Navua, man and wife, as he confesses to the people that even at the shrine there is sorrow, but Lekindo has proved brave enough to hold himself during difficult situations. The title, The Bride, um, when you read through the play, The Bride, that text, use the mic. The title of the play, The Bride, is focused on one of the two main characters in the play called Navua. She's an immigrant girl who, from the alienation of the society, finds herself in a situation of dilemma of choosing herself a husband. She's courted to a skull but ends up getting married to Lekindo, her boyfriend. This title is based on the concept of a play, Two Husbands, One Night, which means that Navua is married to another man on the final night of her wedding. She is therefore the one referred to as the bride. The setting of the play, the bride is an African traditional society of patrolalists living in the plains during the initial stages of the coming of the white man, who was by then referred to as albino by the natives. The main characters in the play, the bride, Lekindo and Navua, their actions and behaviors set the play. And um, here I didn't, I didn't, uh, I just summarized the themes, though in the final work I talked about them fully. The first theme, there is a uh, traditional customs and beliefs. In, um, in the bride, they have a belief that um, once you break your virginity, you're no longer worth to be part of them in the society. You're just an, out an outcast because it's not good to break your virginity before you're married. Then circumcision is also considered as a very, very important issue. Once you're circumcised, you're welcomed to their initiated group, and not only that, you become a woman or a man. If you're not circumcised, you're still seen as a child. Then also, in case uh, any of the rules are broken, like uh, if the initiates associate with uh, people who are not initiated, or welcome them into their initiated group, they are punished. For example, in uh, The Bride, the female initiates, initiates don't want Navua in their group, but the male initiates are against it. However much the elders want them to discriminate Navua, for them they stand their ground that they will not discriminate her, which is against their culture and tradition. And they also believe in Wanga as their god, then we have religion as the second part. They believe in their god, Wanga. Then the next uh, theme was discrimination and alienation, whereby we see Mario's family is alienated, it's discriminated. Navua is also discriminated by the female initiates because she's seen as a taboo. And uh, not only that, towards the end, of the play in our movement for. She, Navua is also discriminated in a way that uh, among all the girls in the village, she's the one who's chosen to get married to the skull, which is really unfair. And not only that, it's a disguise for her to get married to the old man, which is really unfair because she's a human being like the others. Then conflicts, there is a conflict between Navua and the female initiates whereby the female initi initiates don't want Navua to be the moon of the dance. Then also there is a conflict between the female initiates and the male initiates over Navua. Then uh, Lekindo and the father, whereby the father doesn't want his son to interact with Navua at all. Then also Mario and the village elders, where Mario is discriminated by the plain people everyone does not want his family at all. He's a foreigner to them. Then um, we see uh, the other theme is a protest. The protest comes in um, when uh, the male initiates decide not to kill. And also, Navas discrimination from the initiates, 
marrying the skull. So the, the militias come in and protest against it. They fight for her right. Then we have also superstition. In the bride, these people are so superstitious. For example, where Mario tells her wife, his, sorry, his wife to stop calling the daughter loud. Since uh, they have this belief that uh, the more you call someone's name aloud, the spirits might repeat the name. And that means that this person is, actually this person's future will be distorted. She will just have a bad omen. Then they also have this superstition of um, Nkumbu claims that uh, Lerema does not die. So she believes that her keeping the late, the late Sunny's skull, it means that the boy is still alive. Um, in conclusion, therefore, the play is a criticism of outdated and myopic African traditions that have rendered Africa immobile to the progressive change of Western education. The play looks vividly into the way the worship of non-beneficial cultures may create a barrier towards change. Ah, thank you very much for that very interesting and elaborate presentation on the bride. Just a point of addition to focus us on the matter of virginity. We've seen this now in the bride, the burdens, and the floods. I would like you to read the trends about Nancha, how she lost hers, and what happens in the burdens, and what could be the relationship between that aspect of virginity, originality, purity, to the theme of politics in these countries. The bride is a riddle and it's full of imagery. Look at the moon. Look at the, um, the, 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 the um, wanga itself, but also the arena, the Lord, and the very language that is used in reference to whatever they are doing, whatever is happening between these people is something that you must consider, look at. How do you, for instance, understand that dance of the skies? What is the dance of the skies? What is the relationship between Les Jolie, you know, Les Jolie now, has, as a foreigner, he has to go and, um, and appease the gods after losing his wife and cows and a few other things happening negatively about him. How is that acceptable? And Namvua, as a foreign girl, is not, it's not right for her to be accepted in the arena for circumcision. Why should it happen for now, uh, for this jolly and not for Namvoa? Why are people discriminating against in this particular society? And how can it be addressed? How has it been addressed by the Rika of the Albinos? Do you see a relationship with the current trend with the Bazukulus? What has happened to the Bazukulus? Yeah? Why are they becoming so riotous? <laughs> yeah? I hope you are able to, to see a parallel between the way the society thinks. Hmm? To the extent that even in the face of Wanga, Mwanga, they are not listening. They have decided to go apolitical, even while they are being political. So there are a lot of interesting things here in the Ugandan literature scene, 
And I would like us to end here for community worship. And uh, pick up from here in our next well-decided session. Thank you very much. Could somebody give us a word of prayer? Let's humble ourselves for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this precious time that we've been here. We thank you for this lecture that we've had that has been successful. Lord, we pray that as we move out for community worship, may you move with us, may you be with us, may you guard our hearts from evil thoughts. As we go out, lead us, lead our footsteps in each and everything that we are going to do. I make this prayer through Christ our Lord. One of our good friends, the great friend of this university, 